Hey there! So today we're going to start with my favorite topic, which is model fitting. And the idea is that instead of just taking a look at the series, trying to see if we can reconstruct the series, trying to see what's the best model and how to make some diagnosis, diagnostic tests in order to see how good that is. So the main question that we want to answer is this one. So how can we tell if our model captures the data properly? So in, in an ideal situation, we would have something like this. So the result should be pure noise, so simply white noise, Gaussianly distributed random noise. The coefficients should be statistically significant and uncorrelated, meaning that all the weights phi1 or theta1 or whatever are completely relevant for the prediction. The process should be stationary and invertible, and stationary is because then we are assuming that the future is going to be like the past, and invertible means that we are not introducing long-term correlations with kind of, I don't know, misleadingly introduce some correlation between something that happened 100 days ago with now. And the fourth point is going to be, okay, this is going to be a good fit. Actually, when I take a look at the data and I take a look at the fitting, both, or le both more or less should be the same. So let's just start with residual analysis. So imagine that you have some fitting and then you have this residual. So there are a couple of things that you have to check. The first one is heteroclasticity. In this case, everything is okay because you can see that you have constant variance. So you can see that the variability is almost the same for all times, okay? And the second thing that you can do is outlier detection. So imagine that you also plot this two standard deviations, three standard deviations, and four standard deviations. Remember that for Gaussian distribution, plus minus two standard deviations give us 95% confidence interval, or the other way around, 5% five, 5 probability of living outside. So in this case, you don't have three points outside this bar, so well, these two are, are not very relevant. And you have especially a couple of them which are four, beyond four times the standard deviation. But again, for a normal uh, distribution, that means that the probability of that occurring is lower than 0.006%. That means that either the residuals are not Gaussian, or you have to take a look at these outliers in, in, in more detail. Of course, you can trust your eyes, but there are some statistical methods that you can, you can use to check that. And the most popular one is called the Leung box test which basically means that you take the OR correlation at lag Q, you define this function, which is related to the number of observations and with the lag, and then you compute this Q statistic. And the idea is that if this is below a chi square standard deviation with this how many degrees of freedom, then you accept the, the null hypothesis that everything is okay, otherwise you re reject that hypothesis. In our case, basically, when, when you check the residuals, when you call this function box test, you have something like that. So in this case, the p-value is 0.4. So everything that is above 0.05, then you can tell that it's pure noise. So in, this is a very simple and fast way to check if the residuals are, are outside or inside the two standard deviation tests. Okay, but, but to me, it's still visual inspection is always better than any statistical test. Okay, let me show you an example. So let's take this process. Remember, we have one coefficient for y t minus one and one coefficient for epsilon t minus one. So this is an ARMA11 process, okay? This is how it looks. Model identification is not that simple because you can see that you have a lot of bars here. This is, a, of course, a signature that something is going on with the autoregressive part. And then you have a couple of bars there, which is not what we would expect because here we have Q equals one, and then we see a couple of bars there. So you can see that simple model identification is not very robust. So what can we do? The best thing that we can do is try to do some fittings, try to generate new processes with the original data and try to see some diagnostics to check th that parameter. So imagine that we create an ARMA11 process. So remember, ARIMASIM is giving you any process. And now here we are specifying one parameter for the autoregressive part and one parameter for the moving average part. So this process is indeed ARMA11. Okay, and now we have a couple of functions. One is called ARIMA with lowercase a, and in this case, this is included with NER basic installation. We have to specify the order of the feed. Also, if this has some seasonal part, and I'm going to cover that in another video, so forget about that. You have to include the order, and also we have to say we have a drift or no, so we have to include the mean or not. Okay, the other function which is the one that I'm going to use, has the same syntax, almost uh, identical. So the data, the order of, th of the basic process, the order of the seasonal part, and then this include mean is going to give us the truth. Okay, so now let's imagine that we do this fitting. So remember, this is an ARMA11, and here I'm fitting to an R1 process, so I'm skipping the, the moving average part. So let's check the residuals, and here we go. So this is the original data. 
the residuals look pretty normal so this looks okay but the problem is that we have we still have this bar and remember that this bar is related to the our correlation function so this is a signature that we are missing uh, also one level in the moving average part so uh, starting with uh, this very simple model we are also improving our prediction so now we have a good guess of what's going on here so now that we know how to do some fittings let's explore this thing again so we'll start with the same model and here are the residuals and again let's play first with an autoregressive model and this is interesting because you can see that the p-value in this box Lune test and actually you can see that you can have similar results only by checking the residuals but again the idea here is that if you check the residuals then you see something interesting we were starting with an r1 process and now we see that the our correlation function is skipping one of these bars so we are not capturing this part but remember from the other video model identification that whenever we have this that means that we have um, a moving average model and in this case this means that if you take the data and subtract an autoregressive model the residuals are a moving average model of order one so this is a clue of how to improve our model okay another thing interesting is that as we are skipping this part of the fitting we are somehow overestimating the parameter phi one instead of 0.8 it's almost 0.9 okay let's do another experiment let's take the same data and now we're going to do the, the opposite so let's assume that we have a moving average and again this is our signature this is a clue that is something wrong with the residuals and again this is pretty interesting because we are saying okay if you take the original data and then you subtract a moving average with this remainder the residuals are an autoregressive uh, process and in this case you can see that this autoregressive process is giving you this exponential decay and that means that probably the best choice would be to plot the partial autocorrelation function in order to capture the proper part of this autoregressive model. Again, the estimation now is even worse than, than before because we are skipping this part. And then theta 1, which is the coefficient of the, uh, of the moving average part, instead of 0.8 is going to be around 1. And this is what we see here. So now if you take the residuals and you calculate the partial correlation function, you see that clearly we have to include one coefficient for epsilon t minus one, and maybe another coefficient for t minus two, but we have to go one step at a time. So next example, let's include both. So now we have the, the, the autoregressive part and the moving average part. So this model should be better. And here we go. When you check the residuals of this feed, you see that you have this original signal and then the error correlation function is completely uncorrelated. The residuals look pretty normal to me. So I, I would say that this, this process, this model is completely identified in this case. Again, if, if you take a look at the p-value now, this value is large, it's, it's absolutely larger than 0.05. And this means that everything is okay. So all the lag, all the correlation for different lags are between the blue dashed lines. And actually, if now take a look at the data, okay, this is not perfect. So this is not 0.8, and this is of course not 0.8. But again, we have to shrink a little bit the parameters so they are closer to the, the original ones. Okay, the, the second thing that we have to do is check for statistical significance. Remember when, when we saw linear regression that we all not only have the parameters, but we also have some uh, standard error of the parameters. So remember as a rule of thumb, so whenever the standard error, uh, to twice the standard error is not larger than the value itself, then this is going to be a statistical significance. So for instance, here, the standard error is around point, point 0.06, so twice this number is going to be 0.12, and 0.12 is much lower than 0.72, so this means that this is going to be statistically significant. Okay. Another thing is that here we know the, the absolute error, because remember that the standard deviation of the noise is, was originally 0.25, so that number squared is 0 0.0625, which is closer to the fitted one, so the model is capturing pretty well the original data. One way to, to look at that is using the library LMTest and you can see here that we can test the coefficients and now you can see that this estimation that I did, uh, calculating twice this value, is much lower than, than 2, so this is why this is much significant. Actually, if you divide this number by this number, this is going to give us how many sigmas are this, is this value significant, that's why this value is pr practically zero. Number three, we have to check for stationarity and invertible. So remember that stationarity means that this process is going to be the same in the future and in the past. And invertible means that we are dropping long-term correlations. If you remember the syntax of the backward shift operator, we could write in a very compact way uh, regressions that are not very simple. 
So I imagine that we take our model, so this model that we have fitted before, we can rewrite it in this way. And this is interesting because this is a polynomial of degree one with a root at one divided by 0 0.723. Uh, one, because this is the solution of this bracket equals to zero. In the same way, this bracket equals to zero is going to give us a root which is minus one divided by 0 0.925. Okay, why is that? Because basically we are saying that in order to keep this stationary, this is going to be lower than 1, and in order to keep this stable, this is going to be lower than 1. So one way to plot this is using the function autoplot again, but using the fit that we have taken from the Arima function. And here we have this nice plot. This is the real and imaginary part of the solution of these polynomial equations. In this case, the, everything that is multiplying yt is in the left right side of the panel, and everything that is multiplying the noise is in the right hand side of the panel. So anything that is between this unit circle is going to be uh, proper. So for instance, in, in the left circle, if all the, all the roots of these polynomials, in this case we only have one root, is between this circle, we say that the distribution is stable, it's stationary, and anything that is between this circle for, for this panel is going to be invertible. The word inverse here is related to the fact that we are calculating one divided by the pole, by, by, by the root of this polynomial. You might be thinking that we've been lucky having all these roots inside the circles, but, it, but in reality this is because the Arima function is forcing the, the, the solutions to be inside the circle. So when, whenever you have the default parameter, which is transforms dot parse equals true, it's trying to fit all the parameters in, in, in this circle. So this is a kind of regularization. So this is not a coincidence. Number four, always and, and and this is one of the models of this of this course you have to trust your eyes so whenever you have a feed you have to compare the real and the fitted data so com let's compare them so remember that feed number two before was just a moving average process and you can see that the fitting is not very good so the data is this kind of reddish uh, line and the fitted is a bluish line and you can see that okay you have somehow the trend but you're not capturing it properly but if you use the proper feed, the ARMA11 feed, then you can see that there is, there is still some discrepancies because there is noise there, so you cannot always capture all the properties. But overall, things are working pretty smoothly. Now, the interesting part, now that we have a good model, now that we can do some forecasting. And again, this is very simple, so you can use the function forecast and then use the feeding variable and then say how many lags into the future we are going to move. And if you autoplot that, you, you can take the original series, and now you have this prediction into the future. So according to this model, the future is going to be a decline, but don't trust that decline, but you can see that the, the 80 and the 95% predictor intervals are huge, so you cannot tell almost anything with this data. Okay, let's now use some real data. Let's, let's take the Google 200 days of the stock market, and we're going to fit a very simple model, a moving average model. And I'm not going to use the data. Remember that some discussion that we have in the past that we are going to have in the future also. Now we are going to take the derivative of this function because we are going to we want to remove this trend. And again, if we fit this as a, a, a simple uh, autoregressive process, then you can see that the p-value is large. That means that the residuals are okay. And of course, you're capturing pretty well the data. So this is the data. And besides this point, which was a clear outlier everything seems to be okay. So if you check the residuals, it looks nicely. So again, you have this outlier, but again, all the correlation, all the values in the autocorrelation function is behind the bars. Also the partial correlation function that I'm not plotting here, but you can check by yourself. So this means that the, the, the difference of the Google data, meaning the new value, the difference between one, the value one day and the other, so the increase in, in the value of the stock market of Google from one day to another, it's a simple autoregressive model. So basically, this is pure noise. Again, if you want to do some forecasting, you see that you cannot capture these outliers, but you can capture pretty well the trend. And the trend is noise, so I wouldn't put my money into this very simple model. So in summary, so we, we've seen four ideas. The first idea is that you should check the residuals, not only the autocorrelation function, but also the partial autocorrelation function, because we can learn iteratively how to perform this model identification. The second thing that you can do is check if the coefficients are significant, so is if that model has meaningful estimators. 
The third thing that, that you third thing that you have to do is to check for stability or stationarity and invertibility. And the fourth thing, and probably the most important one, trust your eyes because whenever you see something like this, you can tell that your model is not capturing pretty well what is happening in, in the real time series.